Hi, everybody. Welcome to Your Move. I'm Andy Stanley. Let's begin with a job-related question. Do you ever sit at work and wonder, does this even matter? The answer is yes, it matters, and I'm about to tell you why. Stick around. Now, this doesn't come as a shock, but I have not always been this version of me, just like you have not always been that version of you. And once upon a time, I was 16 years old, and once upon a time, I got my driver's license, and my dad said, okay, you got your driver's license, next thing you gotta get is a job. That's right, you gotta get a job. And I'm like, a what? You know, a job? And he goes, yeah, so he said, get in your mom's car and go find a job. And what terrible thing to tell a kid, like, go find a job. Like, how do you go find a job? I mean, what is that? Go find a job. And so I got in my mom's four-door Catalina, four-barrel, you know, went roll around down the road and just went to all these places. And I had a hard time finding a job, and I don't understand why, okay? See, when I sat down with my kids and we watched Napoleon Dynamite, I didn't think it was funny. (laughs) Eventually, I got my first job at a grocery store. How many of you have ever worked at a grocery store? Grocery store, there you go. Yes, but I didn't just work in the grocery store. I worked in the meat department of the grocery store. My job, I know, I didn't didn't eat hamburger my whole senior year of high school. It's like, I'm like, you shouldn't eat that. I make that. You should not eat that, okay? (laughs) Then, um, Then my next great job was at a plaque company. And it, it really should have been, if there was such thing as reality TV, this would have been like the first reality TV show or perhaps the first version of The Office because everybody in this place I worked was a character except for one girl, her name's Dana, and she was like normal. Everybody else was like a character. I'm, I'm serious, okay? The guy that owned the place um, was probably in his you know, early 60s maybe or late 50s, and he was a, he'd sort of become a Christian later in life, and he was a little bit, as, as you may have heard said, he was kind of oversaved. Michael Jr. says, you ever heard about people who are overstayed, they become a Christian later in life and they feel like they have to make up for all of it. So they take like 20 years of Christianity and cram it into about three years and they're just, they're so saved. It's like, okay, we know, you know. So he found these bumper stickers. I don't know if you've ever seen these. Honk if you love Jesus. This was like a big deal in the seventies, you know, honk if you love Jesus, okay. So he found some of these and he put one on his car and he put one on his wife's car. And then he decided to put one on the back of the delivery truck that Clarence drove and didn't tell Clarence, okay? Because it's, you know, it's a company truck. And Clarence is not overly saved. Clarence is just in a bad mood and just sleeps until the truck's loaded. And so we're in there one afternoon, I'll never forget, and Dana was there, and, and, and Clarence comes in, and he's so mad, and we're thinking, the truck broke down. What happened, Clarence? He said, these Atlanta drivers, are down. everybody's honking at me. Everywhere I go, they're honking, honking, honking. He said, I just rolled out my window. He said, I just flipped them all off. I was sick and tired. Everybody honking their horns at me. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm telling you, that's just one story. I could sit here for 30 minutes and tell you stories. Everybody in there was a character. And so anyway, we took the sticker off of the truck, you know, honk if you love Jesus, rolling out of that window. Okay, so anyway, uh, but the point of all this is, I just, I, all of us have had just interesting jobs, haven't we? And not interesting jobs, jobs we look forward to, jobs we learned a lot, jobs we had great bosses, jobs where everybody was a character, jobs that really could have been sitcoms or, or you know, reality TV. We've all, we've, we've all had these jobs, and now this is the coolest part about my career. Now I'm the boss, and it is really fun to be the boss. In fact, I'm, I'm the boss of our organization. Now, you don't think of me as a boss, but I'm the boss. We have like 400 plus employees, and I'm like the boss of an organization of 400 plus employees. So we're like a mid-sized company, you know? One of the things you learn about work, real quick, is everybody answers to somebody, right? Everybody answers to somebody. There is no pure autonomy. Everybody answers to somebody. So a part of the, the, the employment process or the hiring process, we have lots of questions. Like your organization, you have lots of questions. And one of the cool questions that we ask people is this, and this, this is kind of a cool question. Here's the question. What have you done? Now, this is, this is a great question because this isn't what was your previous job or what did you used to do or what was your title or what was your job description at the previous place of employment. This, this is a good question. This is something for you to think about. And if this, my talk gets boring, you can just go back to this question because this is a good question for you to think about. This question is designed to find out, okay, we know you've worked some places. We, we know you held down a job. We know you got a paycheck. But have you done anything? Like, did you make something better? Did you improve something? Did you start something? Did you, did you, have you done anything besides just your job? That's a good question. And then here's the, the other question. I like this one even better. And this is gonna be the jumping off uh, point for what we're gonna talk about tonight. This is 
This is something to think about. Knowing what you know about you, would you hire you? Knowing what you know about you, would you hire you? Knowing how you spend your discretionary time at work, you know, what you do on the internet, how much shopping you do, or you think about how quick you can change that, you know, web browser, you know, you're just, you know, it's like, hey, hey, it's good, it's good, back up, you know. <laughs> Guilty laughter, right, you know, nervous laughter. If, when you think about your work habits, when you get there, when you leave, what you do, how much, how pro, you know, productive you actually are, would, would, knowing what you know about you, would you hire you? Now, when we think about work and we think about a question like this, um, there's a tendency to, to sort of prioritize what we think is important work and what we don't think is important work. And Jesus has some very specific things to say about work. And one of them, as we're gonna discover tonight, is this, that no matter what you do, no matter what you do, no matter what your job is, no matter what your career is, no matter if you're hourly or your career or your graduate school, and I mean, you're, you're good to go, no matter what your job is, your job matters because the people you work with matter. And your job matters, your work matters because the people you work with matter. And your job, get this, actually matters to God because the people you work with matter to God. Now this is a little bit of shift in our thinking about work because when we think about work, we think about what we do and how much we make and where it's taking us and all of those are very, very valid concerns. I mean, they're real valid concerns. I have three kids, two are in college, one just graduated and he's working and I assure you, I'm very interested in what he's doing and how long he's gonna do it and how much he makes. I mean, all that's extremely important. But as you figure out how to climb whatever ladder you're trying to climb, if you're a Christian, there's another layer of consideration when it comes to work, and it's simply this, that no matter what you do, it matters to God. It matters to God because the people you work with matter to God. And when you are in their presence and when you are working with them, you play a very, and this is, this is hard for us to remember, you play a very important role in their life. Let me say that again. You play a very important role in the lives of the people that you work with. And the reason I say that is because of something Jesus said that if you grew up in church, you've heard many, many times, but I wanna narrow the focus of or the application of what he said to the marketplace because this has extraordinary implications when we think about work. And here's what Jesus said. You, you've probably heard these words before. He said, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the light or you're the revealer. You're, the, you're, you're gonna reveal something to the people you work with. You are the light of the world. Now, when we think world, we think globe, we think world, are you kidding? But here, here's the thing. World in this context, in the context we're gonna talk about, is your sphere of influence. And you have three primary spheres of influence. You have family, you have friends, and you have work. You have family, and you have no influence over them, right? You tried, that's why you're gone, you left, so you can't, gotta go, you know? And you don't want them to have any influence over you, that's why you moved to the big city. Just kidding, right? There's family, there's friends, and there's work. And most of us, most of us in this season of our lives spend as much, and in most cases, more time with the people we work with than the people that we play with, and oftentimes even the people that we live with. And so when you think about your three spheres, you, the, your influence, the sphere of work is so extremely important because your best hours, and this drives me crazy, honestly, as a parent, my best hours were given to what I do at work. And so Jesus says, okay, let me put this in context. You are the light of the worlds in which you have influence. And one of your primary worlds is the marketplace. So we could say this, you are the light of the marketplace. That's what you are. Now, the thing is, when you go to work, you don't think this, I don't think this, we just think, what do I do? How much am I being paid? How long do I have to stay? And can I get a promotion or I love this job and I hope I don't lose it? And Jesus says, that's great. But while you are there, there's something else going on. You are, if you are my follower, you are the light of the marketplace. And then he goes on, you, you've heard this. He says, let your light, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. That is, you're gonna do stuff and they're gonna see it and glorify your work ethic and promote you. It's not in there, but that's, how, that's, that's why we go to work, isn't it? 
I go to work, then shine my light, do a really, really good job, that they may see my good deeds. Have you noticed, have you noticed, have you noticed that was my report? Were you there for my presentation? Make sure you get that in on time. Make sure they know it's my idea. They may see my good, did you see how well I cleaned up after everybody else? That they might see my good deeds and glorify my work ethic. Oh my gosh, we're so glad we hired you. Oh my gosh, I wish you'd come early. I would hire 10 of you. You're like the greatest employee I've ever had. Glorify your work ethic and promote you. And you know what? I think you should go for all of this. Jesus' point is if you're my follower, along with this, this is not either or, this is not either or, this is both and. While you are there, while you're demonstrating an extraordinary work ethic and while you're getting promotions and while you're working for raises and while you're trying to get your boss's job, along with all of that, I want you to do your work in such a way that people see, not just what you believe, see your good deeds. And when they're done seeing your good deeds, they will begin to connect some dots between your work, your work ethic, your excellence, your commitment to what they've asked you to do, and your commitment and love for your Father in heaven. That your light would shine before others, that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, Jesus said something else, again, that's not specifically work-related, but again, when you think about your three spheres, this clearly applies to your work. Maybe you've heard this before. You've heard about second-mile service. You've heard about going the second mile. You may not know that that imagery, that word picture, actually came from the New Testament. It actually came from something Jesus taught. Because in Jesus' day, a Roman centurion, some people say a Roman soldier, but a Roman centurion for sure could force any non-Roman citizen, any non-Roman citizen, especially in a conquered land, a Roman centurion could force any non-Roman citizen to carry something a mile in any direction. And you had no choice in the matter. And so the, you know, when people would see the, the Roman soldiers packing up and about to go somewhere, everybody scatters because they don't wanna be handpicked. hey, carry this. I can't make you carry it the whole way, but by law, you have to carry it a mile. And so Jesus dipping into this culture that they were so familiar with creates an imagery that we use even to this day. And here's what he said. He said, if anyone forces you, because they can force you, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. To which, you know, we're gonna say, okay, what if you say, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go one mile, but have a good attitude. You can do that. Go one mile and smile. Go one mile and don't complain. Jesus says, no. I want them to see something in you. So I want you at the end of mile one, when they say, okay, you can put it down, I want you to say no. I would like to volunteer to carry this another mile. So that the person you're carrying this for will look at you and think, what is up with you? Jesus said, here's, the, here's what I'm getting at. I want you to shock them with your response. I want you to shock them with your behavior. And again, he's talking about people who are being forced in a culture that we can't even imagine. And then we come to our 21st century work world and we bring this within the context of work and we realize there's extraordinary application here. So here's what that looks like. If anyone hires you to go one mile, you go too. That whatever they ask you to do, you do more. Oh, so I'll get a raise, so I'll be noticed for my work ethic. Well, yeah, that's part of it. But Jesus says, ultimately, I'm after something more than that. I care about the people you work with. Your work matters because the people you work with matter, and I want you to serve and function as a light within the marketplace, which means you have to do something that gets their attention and then connect the dots between your second mile service and the fact that you're a follower of me. Wow. So bottom line is your work matters to God because the people you work with matter to God. Now, I could just stop there and you'd say, ah, it's, it's pretty good, you know, write that down. I'm not gonna do it, but I wrote that down. It's good, you don't tell somebody about that. So Jesus takes this idea of you're the light of the marketplace, second mile service, do something that connects the dots between the fact that you're my follower and that's why you work so hard, that's why you make things better, that's why you don't complain, that's why you have a better attitude than everybody else, you know, help them connect those dots. Th then he, he makes this so simple that we can't possibly 
miss it. And in fact, in one statement, and again, this is a very famous statement, there's not a person listening, there's not a person here tonight or today who or watching who has never heard this before, this is so common. But listen to these very, very common, these very familiar words of Jesus, and think about it within the context of what you do Monday through Friday, or what you do six or seven days a week, whenever, whatever days that you work. Here's, here's, here's what he said, and let me just say one more thing before we get to it, okay? Again, we can't imagine this. There's no middle class in the first century, none. There's an upper class that is so upper you can't even get close to them. There is a lower class that's so poor they can barely eat. And then there are slaves everywhere. This is a culture that is driven by slavery. And Jesus says the following, which I'm telling you, it's a little bit offensive to me and to you. Imagine how offensive this was to his, his audience. But here's the thing, and if you're a Christian, you should know this. It was this kind of teaching that changed the world, literally. The, the reason that Christianity survived the first century was not just you know, the miracles of Jesus and the stories about Jesus. The reason Christianity survived the first century is because first century Christians did this stuff. And it was so second mile, and it was so unusual, and it was so, are you kidding me? And it was so, what's up with you? that it eventually gained the world's attention and they figured out how to connect the dots between their good deeds and the fact that they were followers of Jesus. So now listen to these words with your job in mind. This is so powerful to me. He says, I'm, this is a little bit of a setup, then we're gonna get to kind of the punchline. I'll tell you when it's coming. He says, but to those of you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do you have any enemies at work? <laughs> you will. It's just, you know, just wait, right? <laughs> Do good to those who hate you. She hates me. Why does she? She just hates me. Jesus says, well, go do good. No, she hates me. I know, so go do good, but she hates me. Jesus is like, I know. You see, you see we're gonna get to this in a minute. If everybody that she likes does good to her, she's not gonna notice. It's when somebody she hates does good, she notices. Oh, yeah, say, okay, follow. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. <laughs> now, let me just give you a heads up. I've been a Christian a long time, and I've been doing what I'm doing for a long time. Nobody does this. I mean, we don't even pray for the people we like. Jesus says, that this is important. Jesus says, I want you to view those who appear to be against you in a completely different way, and I want you to treat them differently than the other people that they mistreat treat them. I want you to, this is second mile. This is, are you kidding? What are you talking about? And then it's like Jesus, it's like he says this and it's like he's thinking, okay, that's complicated. And they're like, what? And so Jesus, this is so great. He says, it's like he thought, how can I simplify this? How can I give them something that they can just hold on to and that they'll never ever forget? And Jesus is like, let me, let me just simplify it for you. Here it is. Do unto others, as the King James would say, do unto others or do to others as you would have them do to you. <laughs> Could you explain that? What does that mean? <laughs> Could this be any clearer? Jesus says, let me, let me tell you what to do. Okay, when you get there and you're not sure what to do, you just think about how you would want to be treated. Okay, got it. And do that. And that's what you'll do as my follower. Do unto others or do to others or do for others what you would want others to do for you. That's how you follow me in the workplace. That's how you be the light of the marketplace. That's how you begin to help people connect the dots between what you are doing that is so unusual, she stayed how late, she worked how hard, and the fact that you are my follower. And then he elaborates a little bit. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. That, that boss that it's like, you know, if, if, if you're just nice to the people who are nice to you, nobody's, nobody's gonna notice that. It's when you're nice to the people who aren't nice to you that people are like, she's weird, she's a freak, he's, I don't, he's odd, but I, I just can't ignore that. And, it goes on. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Even your boss does that, right? Even that, you know, three cubes over by the window, even he does that. I mean, everybody, do, everybody treats people who are nice to them for the most part nicely. Jesus says, I want you to do this differently. I want you to quit taking your cue from them because it's easy to hate people who hate you. 
He says, I don't want you to take your cue from them. It's easy to just you know, ignore people who ignore you. He says, I don't want you to ignore people who ignore you. It's easy to treat people who, you know, they're just not my people as if they're just not your people. Jesus says, that's what everybody does. I want you to treat people the way you want to be treated, and I want you to do it in such a way that someday, somehow, some way, they begin to connect the dots that you are my follower. And then listen to how he ends this. And then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. And how, why would we be children of the Most High? Because it's like father, like son. It's like mother, like daughter. Because he, God, is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And you know what it means? This is interesting for some of you. The worse the place is that you work, the more opportunity you have. The nastier your boss is the brighter your light shines. In fact, it doesn't even have to shine bright at all. You just turn it on a little bit, boop, you see that? (laughs) Boop, little light, little light, this little light of mine don't need much light, it is dark in here, right? (laughs) In fact, here's the thing, I'm not trying to be super spiritual because I don't know. Somebody here, I'm guessing, you've been praying, God, get me out of here, get me out of here. Why do you have me here? Why do you have me here? I hate this place, I hate hate everything about it. It's not my dream job. In fact, it's nobody's dream job, right? And, And, Hopefully God will answer your prayer, but in the meantime, you are the light of the marketplace. And and this is true of all of us. You will either respond to people the way they respond to you or you won't. And Jesus says, I wanna invite you to live a different kind of life because you're the light of the marketplace. Your work matters to God because the people you work with matter. To God. So what do we, in the final thing, kind of land in the plane. So basically what we have is the golden rule of work. That's what we have. It's the golden rule of work. The golden rule of work is, we've already said it, work unto others as you would have others work unto you. Boss unto others as you would have others boss unto you. Manage unto others as you would have others manage unto you. Any salespeople in here? Sell anybody salespeople sell? Yeah, there you go, yeah. Sell unto others. <laughs> as you would have others. Sell unto you. Now let me say something about this sales thing a second. Because I know, it, I, I, I've been around a while. I know what, it's like, Andy, okay, you don't understand. See, if we were honest, we wouldn't sell any of our product. Our product, our industry thrives on dishonesty, okay? So if I was like to be, it's like, okay, before we sign this, I need to disclose some things. First of all, I'm gonna need a job right after we finish this conversation. That's my first disclosure, because when my boss finds out what I'm about, you know, I get that. And, and here, here's, the, here's the powerful thing about being a Christian, about being a Jesus follower, I'm telling you. If you're in one of those industries and your conscience bothers you every time somebody signs or you know, as you think about what you do, you think, I kind of live in a world of lies and I kind of live in a world of you know, half-truths and I kind of live in a world of I hope they don't find out, but if they do, they've told me what to say in case they, if you live in that world, here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to bring that to God and say, God, until you find me another place to work, would you show me how to honor you in an industry, to honor you in a company, to honor you with a product that is rarely ever presented in a way that's honoring to you? And God will answer that prayer. In fact, one of my favorite stories in all the scriptures about this is the story of Daniel. You can read it in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Daniel. It's easy to find, you know. And Daniel finds himself in a very similar situation. I'll let you read the story for yourself. But Daniel puts God to the test. And Daniel does something very, very, very interesting that is instructive on how to survive a hostile situation when you are being required to do something that goes against your conscience. And God honored Daniel's faithfulness even though he did not remove Daniel from a place where he was being forced to compromise almost every single day. Barista unto others as you would have others barista unto you, right? And here's the last one. It's fill in the blank. What do you do? What's your job? What, what, what does it look like to do whatever you do unto others as you would have others do whatever you do unto you? Now, one more thing about this, this is so huge. 
in work world, and you know this, in work world, the reason this golden rule is so important, you know, work on others as you would have others work unto you, the reason this is so important is because in work world, your tendency and my tendency, the tendency is always to treat those beneath us the way we were treated by those above us. There is always gonna be the tendency to treat those beneath you the way you were treated by those above you. That now it's your turn. Now it's your turn to have a bad attitude. Now it's your turn to be the boss. Now it's your turn to get your way. And Jesus is not my followers. You you do not take your cue from the people around you. You take your cue from your heavenly father and you fill in the blank unto others as you would have others fill in the blank unto you. The golden rule of work, work unto others as you would have others work unto you. Can you imagine what this would look like? And and I don't think this is so far-fetched because we've all seen enough, we've seen glimpses of this to know how this works. At the end of the day, your work, your work matters because the people you work with matter to God. The people you work with matter to God so much, and this is hard to believe. The people you work with matter to God so much that he put you there as a light to that world. So tomorrow, starting tomorrow, bring your energy to work early. Bring solutions. Quit responding to people the way they respond to you. You're better than that. Tomorrow, shock somebody with how far you're willing to walk with them and for them. Shock them. Tomorrow, shock somebody with how willing, how far you are willing to walk for them or with them. And if you get confused, you're not really sure what to do, and you forget everything else I said, you simply remember this. As a follower of Jesus, my responsibility is to work unto others as I would have others work unto me. And Jesus says, if you do, then your reward will be great, and you will be a child of the Most High because you have now done unto others as your heavenly father once did unto you. 